So today I'm going to talk about Satan. How does that sound? How many of you are, are under his influence? Right? Well, you're honest. I like that. I like that. You might get it. That, that's good. You know, so the topic is, is the reality of evil and the devil and how we can protect ourselves, our children, our families. Um, but I also think, you know, when was the last time that you heard a homily on the presence and the power of the evil one? It's rare. Yeah. It's rare. It's almost as if Satan doesn't exist. Well, he, ex he exists out there like in Ukraine, right? Under all that war. He exists on the streets of Chicago, New York, all those people being killed. That he exists out there. That's, what pe that's oftentimes how people think. And some don't believe he exists at all, right? Or they think he has little impact on their lives. So I said people think of evil only, oftentimes only in the sense of violence and murder, war, abortion, I mean all of those types of things, right? Many Catholics and Christians believe they're automatically going to heaven without any consideration of how Satan influences or impacts, impacts their lives, their choices, and their decisions. But the good news is, we'll start with the good news, all right? <laughs> the, the good news is the victory of Christ over Satan has happened. Do you think, really? Then how come it's so wild in our world today? Well, because. That's the mystery. But the victory over, of Christ over Satan is, is that of love over hatred, truth over lies, and good over evil. You know, the power of Satan's been around since the beginning of time. You go back to the, you know, the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, right? When Adam and Eve, when, when they were tricked, seduced, right? Oh, if you just, you know, don't, you can't, you know, you were told not to eat of the fruit of the tree, so oh, don't worry about it. You know, this isn't really, you know, you, you can become little, you can become like God if you do that, right? It was a temptation. And what did they do? They did it. And what happened? Because of that, you and I are affected by the evil one in our world today. Everyone is. Right? It's, it's a result of original sin. Right? We're all impacted. Bapti baptism takes it away, right? Original sin, but it doesn't take the effects all the completely away. Right? Because original sin, I mean, you were doomed forever. Baptism, baptism says you're not doomed forever. You're destined for eternity. That's why your, the date of your, celebrating the date of your baptism is so important. Because it keeps us mindful of that, right? But, you know, Christ's victory has been won. And then that doesn't mean that, that Satan doesn't, hasn't, his power hasn't gone away. But it's important to notice that he has no power unless you and I give it to him. Think about that. Satan has no power over us unless you or I give it to him. I'll talk about that in a minute, but keep that in the back of your minds. Right? There's a book I'm reading, it's called The Deceiver. It's by Father Livio Vanzaga. It's uh, The Deceiver, Our Daily Struggle with Satan. It's very good. Very good. But in this book he writes, he says this, and I'm going to quote him. He says, we already, en we already enjoy the benefits from this triumph. That means the triumph of Jesus over evil, right, over Satan. But the dragon, he says, is only injured, and his ability to seduce and devour is still very strong. Right? We only have to look around us, right? And within us. You know, no one is exempt from this menace, as much as we would like to be. He goes on to say, nothing is more important to God than a soul. Think about that. Nothing is more important to God than your soul. Think about that. Allow that to sink in. Nothing is more important to God than your soul. Nothing is more dear to, man, to God than man. 
quotes, he says, God loves man as a son and has prepared for us the greatest things his omnipotence could allow. There isn't any greater gift for us than to participate in God's divine nature. That's what baptism has allowed each of us, a participation in God's divine nature. That's why that date is important. Like I said, more important than your baptism or your, your birthday, in my opinion. But this, the thing is that Satan is jealous of all of this. Right? He wants to be like God, and he can't. Right? And your kids and your ter you know, your kids or grandkids in their terrible twos, right? They want something and they can't have it. So what happens? They throw a temper tantrum. And sometimes they get on the floor and at least the ones I've seen, right? I don't know if that's your kids ever did that, but they get on the floor and they start you know, screaming and yelling and they're having a temper tantrum because they can't have what they want. S Satan's temper tantrum is going after us. Right? So instead, he, he, wants, he, he wants to be like God, but he can't. So instead, he competes with God for every soul. He competes, searching to seduce the soul in every way to make it his, to become its Lord in the reign of death. So every soul torn, torn away from Christ is a victory for Satan. But again, he cannot seize anyone without the consent of the person. But then neither can God, right? Neither can God. So this is the, this is the struggle between heaven and earth, which involves our eternal destiny. And if someone just, I don't know where I heard it, where I just heard it, but ultimately it's decided by our free will, right? We all have free will. And so, friends, as, as disciples of Jesus, you and I are constantly in a spiritual battle with the evil one. Constantly. But oftentimes we don't realize it, or we don't think about it. I mean, how many of you got up this morning thinking about the Satan and the influence of Satan in your life? Nobody. Because Satan is something far away you know, we live life as like life, we live life and we don't think about, I mean, it's easy to ask the question, how many of you are under the influence of Satan and you all raise your hand, right? But you would have never thought about that if I wouldn't have asked the question, would have you? No. You wouldn't have, I know you wouldn't have. <laughs> because in some ways we are convinced that Satan doesn't bother us. Oh, I'm a good Christian. I just came from Mass. I received the Lord Jesus and the Eucharist. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. So therefore, he has, he has no impact on my life. That's not true. That's not true. And if we believe he has impact on our life, what are we doing to resist the temptations? What are we doing to resist that power that he seeks to take over in our life? What are we doing? You know, he talks about in this book, he says, you know, who are our enemies? Because this is a spiritual battle. Who is the enemy? The most dangerous enemy of man is man himself. You may think, oh, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm good, right? Our first enemy is, a, is our partially corrupted nature. It's a result of original sin. It's the effects, the ongoing effects of original sin, right? And this undisciplined flesh, which means our, this is a flesh means our, our worldly, you know, St. Paul talks about flesh is, is, is the worldly. You know, we live in worldly, right? So this undis undisciplined flesh is the most devious enemy of our eternal salvation. So our corrupted nature within us can rationalize anything and everything, right? Whether it's right or wrong, you know? You could do something to someone else, right? Good or bad. And you can rationalize why this is, this is appropriate, right? No matter if it's good or bad. 
If I say something nasty to you, I can, ra I should, I can rationalize why that was okay. Right? And we do. You can convince yourself. Don't we? Don't we? Yeah. No, the evil one convinces us that that's, that's appropriate and that's good. Right? So, um, you know, so another enemy outside of us and, and one that's all around us and one that seizes us is the world in which we live. Even though all of creation is, uh, comes from God, the dominant culture is an enemy. Particularly of the way of thinking and living promoted by the mass media, we all know this, right? It conditions our thoughts and our actions, molding a mentality in us which is far from the wisdom of the gospel. And you and I are influenced by all of it, right? How many of you watch week after week these comedies on television that has all kinds of sexual innuendos in them, right? And you laugh, it's funny, and we watch it again next week, and the next week, and the next week, right? Many people do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on television. But, but many people watch that trash. It's all over television. A lot of the stuff on network TV is trash. But we, sit, we spend hours week after week after week watching it, don't we? Why? What, is that, what value is that up to you? Except over time it begins to distort, distort our thinking. Right? Our way of thinking. It does. I happen to believe all of these games that kids play on the computers or on the television, what are these? Not Nintendo, it's not Nintendo anymore. What is it called, kids? Xbox, Xbox and all this stuff and all these, these violent games, right? Which are very popular. What do they do? They desensitize people to violence, right? It's the evil one that's working, because the evil one is silent, right? He didn't say, oh, you should say that to somebody. He doesn't say that, he's silent. But he moves our, our interior life in such a way that we give in. He sugarcoats everything, right? I mean, if he put it just the way it is, you would say no to that, right? But he makes it look like candy, chocolate, right? And you love that. And so you take it. That's what he does. That's what he does. And so like these Xbox games that are filled with violence, you wonder why young people grow up today and they have, they're just desensitized to violence, to the violence in our world today. That's why they can go out and, as they grow up, they can go out and get in gangs, they can go out and do violence on other people because it's like, wow, this is, I learned this playing games on the computer or on the tele or on the, uh, the Xbox or whatever those are. Movies are the same way. How many movies do you go, have you gone to in the last, I don't know, I don't go to movies usually, um, but you know, how many movies do people go to that are filled with sex and violence? All of them are. But you go to them. You pay big money to go watch all that stuff. And that begins to desensitize your, your mind and your heart. It's the evil one working underneath all of that in silence. That's what's happening. That's why our culture today is it, it's, it's in the tank. Because this has been going on for, and even more so, over a long period of time. And our media has bought into all this stuff. No, it's, um, it's sad. It's sad. But, but we're all influenced by all of it. What you read influences you. What you watch on TV influences you. Our family, our friends, our co-workers, neighbors, they all influence us, right? Far more than we're, we're readily willing to admit. And behind the wickedness of the flesh and the false lights of worldly vanity, the untiring adversary of God who is Satan, the enemy of man, he works, quietly works. So I said he's not visible like an enemy. He's very real. He's shrewd. He's successful in hiding himself. Friends, our task is to discover him 
look for him in the innumerable situations of life where he hides to set traps for you and me. He's very subtle. He's very subtle. And the more we live in the light of Christ's love, right? The more we live in the light of Christ's love, the more subtle he has to be. Because he knows he has he doesn't have power over us as much. But again, he has no power on us or over us unless we give it to him. It's all three will. And we give it to him by the choices we make, by the things we watch, by the things we read. We give it to him. But you may not, you won't you we don't do it consciously, but we do it subconsciously. We do it subconsciously. Amen. The spirit of spiritual warfare lasts the whole, t whole of our lives until the time of death. And Jesus calls each of us, he calls us to be vigilant, prayerful, and persevering. Right? We have a choice to live in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. It's all about the choices we make on a daily basis. Right? What's the Satan's role? What's his role? You know, his fundamental sin is the sin of disorder. He wants to create disorder. Do you think our, our culture today is disordered? Or do you think it's ordered toward Jesus? What, what do you think? Right? Well, how does that disorder happen? It happened through people like just like us. It happens to us, human beings. That's how the disorder happens, right? Satan is, uh, there's, there's a number of names for Satan. One is he's an adversary, right? What's an adversary in this context? Oh. Well, I think it's anyone or anything, anyone or anything which deflects us from the way of God. It's any influence which seeks to make us turn back from the hard way which God has set before yeah. us. The life of a Christian is a hard way. And if we're living it the easy way, then we've created discipleship in our own little box. Right? An adversary in this context is any power which seeks or attempts to make our human desires take the place of the gospel way of life. The gospel way of life is hard. Unless you deny yourself and pick up your cross daily, you cannot be my disciple. So are we a disciple of Jesus or are we not? This is a question. So he's an adversary. Satan, you know, the name devil comes from a Greek word that means divides. He's a great divider. Right? Satan's the great divider. Yeah, and his work of division begins with the fundamental cell of society. What is that? The family. He has disintegrated many families. He's very accomplished at this. How can this happen? Well, in many cases, the young couple who present themselves for marriage are spiritually empty. They don't know Jesus. And their heart says they don't really care. Sad to say. But they present themselves to the church, they get married in the church, but they're spiritually desolate. A desolate spirit <laughs> is an open door to the evil one. It is, right? It is. So what's our spirit like? Right? So their union is built on, on sand and not on rock. And so what does the gospel say? When the storms come and the house is built on sand, what happens? It goes down the river in pieces. This happened to many families in our culture today. 
but it begins there. The evil one is untiring in trying to destroy a couple's marriage. And if there are children involved, Satan continues on one person at a time. One at a time, one at a time. Right? So we can see, begin to see our culture today and how broken it is. Right? That doesn't happen naturally. You know? It's not just a circumstance of the times. It's a circumstance of, of the lack of God in our world today. And we cannot, con we, we, you know, we cannot deceive ourselves to say it's something different. I don't believe. Right? I don't know, you may disagree with me and that's fine, but I know a lot of families have, that have been destroyed. I know a lot of marriages that have ended in divorce. Um, I know many families who after the divorce, the kids are fought over, right? How, how do you think that impacts the kids, right? Terrible. You know, so the process of the, you know, the, the work of the evil one continues on and on and on and on and on. He doesn't stop just breaking up a couple, right? And a family that is spiritually empty, the kids are going to grow up spiritually empty. And you wonder why there's no young people in church today? Right? Because the evil one is doing his work, you know, undercover. Because that's what he does. He's quiet and he's silent. <coughs> but he's working. We can be sure of that. Right? And so in, in, in families that are spiritually um, empty, he doesn't have to work too hard. Into, bring dis into, 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 into bringing disorder into their lives. He doesn't have to work too hard. He doesn't. His goal is to get people to turn away, completely away from God. That's his goal, because when that happens, he's got you. And it's only by the grace of God that can, someone can turn back. Right? We don't want him under, we don't want to give him any power that he doesn't have, but we do, right? So when members of any social group, family or whatever it might be, you know, that are spiritually empty, they have no defenses. They have no defenses, right? Satan is very convincing in his work. He's the great seducer. It's another title for him, the great seducer, right? He's a great deceiver, right? They should have put great on this book. Instead of just the deceiver, he's a great deceiver. He's very convincing in his own quiet way, working on the empty hearts of people. And as I said, his desire is to destroy the lives and then of people and then destroy society itself. That, I believe, is what's happening right now in the United States of America. And we can't kid ourselves as saying that's not reality, because it is. So, let me, um, now we don't have a lot of time. I could spend here two hours talking about all this. But, how does this impact us personally, right? I mean, because obviously we have some defenses, right? We just, one of the greatest defenses against the evil one, we just celebrated, right? It's the Eucharist, right? So, what, but before, what, what are the temptations in our daily life that would, that opens the door? And he only needs, he, <laughs> he, he only needs a little, 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 little bitty crack. A crack that you probably couldn't see. He only needs that much. Seriously. He doesn't need much. Just a little crack. And we give him that crack frequently. So temptations in, the, in daily life. One is a neglect of God and a, a neglect of prayer. If families are not praying together, 
couples aren't praying together, you're opening the door. <coughs> you're giving him that crack. If we're, not, if, if we're neglecting God daily in our daily life and we're not praying, we're opening the door. <coughs> if we are attached to material things, instead of godly things, right? Where's the balance? Material things, godly things, if we're attached to worldly things, to material things, that opens the door. And we see it all the time. I and mean, people want, you know, they, they're going to, you know, tear down a half a million dollar home they just bought and tear it down and build a million dollar home. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Doesn't that happen? No. That's a deep attachment to material things. <laughs> or they have to have the latest and the greatest, the brightest and the best, the most expensive and, right? Because there's an attachment to material things that turn us away from God, right? In your thoughts, you have worries and anxieties. Any everybody worry? Anybody worry? <laughs> huh? Why do you worry? Why do you worry? Don't you have faith in Christ? It's a serious question. Why do you worry? Don't you have faith in Jesus? Or have you put God in a little box? Is this your box? Is it this box? Is it this box? Like I said upstairs? Worries and anxieties like because Satan doesn't succeed in leading us to sin, right? You came to Mass, so he's going to have a hard time taking you by the hand and come on. Come on. <laughs> right? You're going to resist, right? He knows that. He knows that. He's not stupid. He knows that. But he hits us on the psychological level to create disquiet and anxiety. And we let him do it. That little crack. He causes us to become obsessed about things in life. How many of you are obsessed by things in life? Your future, family, health, like everything's out of control. Nothing's like normal. I don't know what normal is supposed to be, but nothing's normal. <laughs> right? And so we worry, it builds up anxiety in us. You know, we can't sleep. Right? Does that happen to anybody? <laughs> Why? You've given Satan permission. Because he, he goes after us psych, and on a psychological level. Right? Do you have distrust in anyone? Anything in life? Do you complain a lot? Anybody complain a lot? <laughs> Why do you complain? Isn't life good enough? You have Jesus, isn't that good enough? Isn't that enough? So do you begin to understand, you understand what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. Satan wants to make you discontented, anxious. And he does a good job at it, I think, with many people, myself included. I have to put myself in that category sometimes. You ever get irritable? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Does he ever get irritable? <laughs> he just lied to me. <laughs> there's a lack of understanding or there's a lack of reciprocal acceptance, right? You know, the world today, our culture today is filled with infidelity and immodesty and lust. It's everywhere. Everywhere. You know, the pornographic industry today you know, is um, it's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. Why is that? Because the evil one is alive and well. And he plays on our passions, our sexual passions. And when we give in to that, this is where it leads. You know? 
You know, when I hear confessions these days, I hear a lot of people, a lot of people confessing pornography, the use of pornography. A lot of people. They know it's wrong, right? We all know it's wrong, and we know why it's wrong, hopefully, but yet we still do it. Why is that? Because the, uh, the evil one plays on our passions. And once he begins to draw you in, close to the net, <laughs> then you're at the point of no return. You're going to give in. Because you're weak. We're all weak. We don't have the strength to... Because we've turned away from Jesus. He is our strength. Right? And so when you get this close to the temptation, forget it. You're done. You start doing things you, don't, you know is wrong. And then you feel shame and guilt, don't you? Which is another, which is another thing that the evil one wants you to feel, is shame and guilt. Right? And bad about yourself. You know? He wants to take away your self-worth. Right? He wants, you, he wants to convince you that you were not created in God's image and likeness. Right? You're just another person who can't control them yourself. Ha, 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 I got you. Right? Gossip? Do you gossip? You talk about others when they're not there in a negative way? That's gossip. I hate to tell you. Do you do that? You lie? You use foul language? Inappropriate language? Again, the evil one, he hits us on, a psycho, on the psychological level to create disquiet and anxiety. Right? You jealous? Envious of what other people have? Is there somebody in your life you're unwilling to forgive? These are just some things to think about in the sense that if I say, if I, if I have to say yes, if I'm honest and I have to say yes to any of these things, then somehow the evil one has, has touched your life in a way on an interior level that's caused you to act in this way. Right? He has power. He does. But not if we don't give it to him. How do you spend your free time? You know, Satan has co-opted television. How many hours a night do you watch television? How many hours a week do you watch television? I mentioned this earlier, but he's co-opted TV to unbelief, immorality, frivolous, and empty vision of life. I'm not saying television is bad, because it's not. It's not. Television in and of itself is good, right? It's good. But he can use it to divide families. He can use it to destroy family prayer. I mean, how many of you get together with your family and pray together on a daily basis? You should be. That should be part of your daily life. If Jesus is the most important person in our life, then we should be praying with those around us daily. Instead of watching television. Satan doesn't want you together with your family members, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids. He doesn't want you together to pray because you're taking away his power. Right? That's what's happening. He doesn't want you to pray. You know? He wants, he wants to convince you, oh, I don't have time to pray. Right? How many of us have ever said that? I don't have time to pray today. Right? You can't find time to pray in 24 hours? So what are you spending all your time on? What am I spending all my time on? Right? I mean, I know this is true because I'm affected by it. 
You know, sometimes I'm thinking, of, well, I'm going to just watch this news program, and then I'll go do evening prayer. Literally the hours, right? So instead of like doing it at five o'clock, it end, ends up getting done at nine o'clock because I didn't stop, right? I was in, interested in something that was not God, which was the news. I chose the news over God. We know, we know when we're being tempted, right? And yet we're, we say no, or we say yes to this, right? I know this is not right, but somehow, in some way, <laughs> God forgive me, <laughs> you know? But it happens to all of us. That's how the evil one works, right? Oh, just give me a half hour more, and then I'll go pray. Just give me another half hour more, and then I'll go pray. And the next thing you know, it's three hours, and I never got any prayer in, right? Because he wants, he does everything he can to turn us away from the Lord. Everything, right? And as I said, if he gets this close, if we get this close to the snare, we're done. Right? We're done. So when that first thought comes, well, I need to go pray, not I need to, I should go pray, then I should go pray. Right? When that thought enters my head, then I should do what that thought is in my head and say, no, I'm going to do this. Right? We should. But it's all, kinds of, it's all kinds of things in life like this, that we say yes to one thing and no to God in some other way. Because this seems to be more attractive, because Satan makes it more attractive. Right? Oh, but this is my favorite program. <laughs> and the Lord says, well, like, your favorite program is better than me? Right? That's what, he's, that's what it is. Right? Your favorite program is better than him. Wow. I don't, you know, that's what the Lord is saying to us as we bought into the temptation that yes, it is in this moment. Does it make sense? So, so Satan can use all of these things to divide families, destroy family prayer, and abort dialogue between family members. You know, you know, these um, gadgets do the same. How many times have you gone into a restaurant and either done it yourself or watched, looked, watched around at other tables and around the table of four, everyone is on the cell phone. Nobody's talking to each other. How many of you have done that? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't care. But this is what the evil one wants you to do. He wants you to spend your life on this so he, so he can destroy your relationships around you. This is what he wants, seriously. How many hours a day do you spend on your cell phone? That will tell you one thing, you know? I get a text, I get an email every day, I think every day telling me, or a text or something, telling me how much I've spent on my, on, on my device for the day. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> that is humanly impossible. <laughs> Oh, it's not that bad. Come on. <laughs> but the, the evil one will make you think, oh, it's not that bad. I mean, he'll convince you. It's all, it's not that bad. He'll convince you of that. It's not all that bad. He will. Because he doesn't, he can't come in and just like destroy your life like, like that. It's over. It's over a long period of time. Little, he has all the patience in the world. He has all the patience in the world. And he takes us, he can have as much time as he needs. Much time as he needs. He's quiet. He's stealth. Right? But he convinces, oh, it's not, it's not, come on, it's not that bad. Even, that, even to think about that, oh, that thought, and, and to think, oh, it's not that bad. Well, it is that bad. Right? But he's convinced it's not that bad. Right? Does this make sense? So, it's something for us to think about if we want to live a life more in the light of Christ, then we, stop, we have to stop giving the evil one power, the power that we are. And you might think, well, I'm not doing that. Well, yes, you are. 
We all are. You know, we all are. Another thing that I think is important to say, I mean, Satan hates, he hates the penitent. He hates the penitent. It would be his greatest day if none of you ever went to confession ever again. That would be his greatest day. Would be. He hates the penitent. Why? Why do you think he hates the penitent? He doesn't want you to go to confession. And he will use anything in his power to keep you from going. Because he knows that when a person goes to confession, no matter what their sins are, no matter how bad they are, no matter how bad they are, if they are confessed, if these sins are confessed, Satan has lost his grip. And so he will try to impede this. So when God says, today you should go to confession, he'll say, no, you, we can wait till tomorrow or next week. It's not all that important. Right? How many of us, well, you don't have to raise your hand, but I think it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> you know, how many of you know you should go, but then you put it off and put it off, put it off, right? Could be a week, two weeks, a month, six months, a year, five years, 10 years, 30 years, right? He loves that. He loves that. You've given him power. That's the thing. You've given him power. You've given him power. Right? Why? So, you know, so when he, 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 wants, he wants to succeed in stealing from you the time allotted for conversion. Like, isn't the sacrament of penance the sacrament of conversion? Right? Where we encounter the love and mercy of Jesus in a very personal and intimate way. Right? And that, that's what happens in the sacrament of penance. It's a, it's a beautiful personal encounter with the love and mercy of Jesus in a very intimate way. Do you think he wants that to happen? Of course he doesn't want that to happen. So he's going to convince you you don't need to go. Oh, I haven't been that bad. <laughs> I haven't been all that bad. Why, you, why should I go to... Why should, well, I haven't been that bad. Right? Right? These are things, these are thoughts we think, aren't they? Which means we've given power to the evil one. Right? I mean, I tell people, if you don't go to confession, why? You know, if it's a beautiful, personal, in, intimate encounter with Jesus, like, who, who wouldn't want that? Except Satan. Who wouldn't want that? So why are we, why is we allowing him to convince us we don't need, we don't need it? I know you can put it off. You're not so bad. Come on. Right? Does that make sense? He also tries to convince people from being honest in the confessional. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I go on. I've heard confessions and someone has confessed a sin. I said, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not sure what that person meant by this. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> so I'll ask a question. So was it this? Yeah. Well, why didn't you just say it? Why are you hiding? Be honest. You can't be honest before God. Come on, he already knows it. But the evil one doesn't want you to be honest, right? He doesn't. He wants you to hide. He wants, to, he wants us to hide behind our sins. And then hide behind the shame that, that they cause. Right? That's what he wants. He, want, he wants you to water down your confession to make it not seem so bad. Because right? it makes us feel good about ourselves. So I, I've gone to confession now. Okay, I've done it. Oh, thank God, I've done it. I've done it. He doesn't want you to, he, he wants you to have that attitude when you leave the confessional too. Oh, I've done it. Oh, thank God that's over. Which means you haven't gone to confession with the right mindset that this is a beautiful encounter with Jesus. Right? You should not leave the confessional feeling bad. Never, never, ever, 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 
ever. Let me say that again. You should never leave the confessional feeling bad about yourself or anything else. Ever. Because if you do, that means you haven't opened yourself up to the love and mercy of Christ and his redeeming love for you, or you don't believe it. Which is another thing the evil one does. He wants you to feel bad when you leave the confessional. He wants, he's tried to instill doubts about forgiveness. Trying to convince the penitent that he or she is really not forgiven. Oh, you're not really forgiven for this. Are you kidding? That's so horrible. He would never forgive you for that. He insinuates doubts and fears, uncertainties about past sins. You know, I've, I've heard confessions before and people would say, and I'm sorry for all the sins of my past life. And I'm thinking, well, why are you saying that? Why are you bringing that up again? Those have been forgiven a long time ago. Why are you, why, why are you holding on to them? Because somehow in your mind they were so bad that you can't let them go. Well, Jesus has forgot about them a long time ago when you confessed them the, fir the first time. But people, but, but you're convinced in your own mind, I can't let go of these because they, I don't know why, they give you your identity or something. I, I, I don't really know. But I hear a lot of confessions that people would say, and, and all the sins of my past life. And maybe it's a formula you learned, I don't know. But if it's a formula, get rid of the formula, because that's heresy. It's heresy, right? Why bring, why bring the sins of your past life up again if you've already confessed them? Doesn't make any sense to me, right? Does that make sense? That makes sense to me, but... Because Satan, above all, he wants to succeed in taking away your peace. So if you leave the confessional without a peaceful heart, then he succeeded. And it also says something about your faith, or maybe your knowledge of the faith, I don't know. We are not the sum of our weaknesses. I've said this many times, and I'm going to repeat it until it sinks into our heads and we believe it. We are the sum of the Father's love for us. That's what confession is about. Right? So if you leave the confessional feeling bad about yourself, it's not God's fault. It's yours. That you've given your, in, your heart to the temptations of the evil one because he wants to make you feel that way and he will put thoughts in your head that you can rationalize well I should feel this way because no you shouldn't feel this way because right but that's his that's his work and so when you now tell me if you leave confession feeling bad about yourself I would think most people if that happened over and over and over and over again they would stop going to confession. Are you going to continue to do something that makes you feel bad <laughs> over and over and over again? And you're going to go, you keep doing it? Why, do you like to keep feeling bad or something? I don't, I don't know. Right? But most people would quit going. And I think that's what's happened. People have no sense of sin today in their own life. They don't know how the evil one works on their life. Hopefully today has been helpful in some way. Um, but... You know, confession is a beautiful, it's a, <laughs> it's a, in my opinion, outside of the Eucharist, the sacrament of penance is the greatest sacrament the Lord's given to us. I love it. I love it. And I'm a sinner, I'm telling you. <laughs> right? But Satan wants to succeed in taking away our peace, this interior peace and calm, tranquility. He wants, he wants to make us feel shameful. Wants to wants us to condemn ourselves. He wants us to, you know, anything that wants us to give us anxiety. He wants to make us worry about everything. He wants to foster distrust in our relationships. He wants um, he wants us to impede in 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 ways of, you know, our sexual life, our sexuality, you know. 
wants to gossip about others, he wants he deceives us, I mean, he wants us to be dishonest, he likes all that stuff. And so if we're doing any of that stuff, then we've caved to his temptations. Above all, his desire is to weaken your faith in God. Why? Because that will stunt your spiritual growth. That's it. He wants to weaken our faith. We have a lot of Catholics in our church today have a weak faith. That's why they're not in the pews on Sunday. Because the evil one has taken away this desire for the Lord. And yeah, we had that we in the gospel last a couple of weeks ago, first Sunday of Lent, Jesus was tempted, right? In the in the in the desert. What were the temptations all about? One was command this stone to become bread. So it was about the lust of the flesh. You know, food, drink, comforts, all of that. One was about the lust for power and glory. I shall give you all this power and glory if you worship me. We all like power and glory, don't we? Another one was pride. Jesus took, say, took Jesus to the most public place in Israel, the temple, right? So now everyone can see him, right? And encouraged him to perform a miraculous stunt that would make him a celebrity, right? That's what he does. These are the strongest passions we have, and much of our sin flows from them because they're disordered. Because sin flows from disordered passions and desires, right? And they're most, mostly likely related to a passion for power, authority, or for the worldly. And so, when we find ourselves in our most vulnerable moments, these are often the greatest times of temptation. So it's important to think about. But I'm going to conclude here because we went over. I'm, I apologize, but St. Paul encourages us with these words. Draw your strength from the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. So they had the devil back during St. Paul's days too. He says, for our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. Draw your strength from the Lord and from his mighty power. Put on the armor of God so that you might be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to conclude with the prayer I pray every day. I pray this prayer every single day. I've already prayed it once today, but I think I need it now because I'm going to be I'm going to be attacked the rest of the day by the evil one. Seriously, seriously, because of what I've shared with today. I know that because that's what he does. He's mad at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he's mad at me because he, he has no power over me, at least right now in this very moment. In this, in this second, he has no power. <laughs> but he's, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. And that's okay. I don't care. But this is a prayer that I pray daily because it, it helps me. Um, well, you'll, you'll know when you hear it. So pray with, we'll pray this together. So, but... It's a prayer to the Heavenly Father, okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you for all you have given me. Please cover me with the protected, precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and increase your Holy Spirit in me with his gifts of wisdom and knowledge, understanding, hunger for prayer, guidance, and discernment, to help me know your will and surrender to it more completely. Father, please heal my negative emotions and any wounds in my heart and spirit. Send the sword of your Holy Spirit to sever and break all spells, curses, hexes, voodoo, all negative, genetic, intergenerational, and addictive material. 
past, present, or to come, known or unknown against me, my relationships and family, finances and possessions. Father, I forgive and I ask forgiveness for my sins and failings. And I ask that my whole person, body and mind, heart and will, soul and spirit, memory and emotions, attitudes and values be cleansed, renewed and protected by the most precious blood of your son Jesus. In the name, power, blood, and authority of Jesus Christ, I bind and break the power and effect in and around me of any and all evil spirits who are trying to harm me in any way. And I command these spirits and their companion spirits in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to leave me peacefully and quietly and go immediately and directly to the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ in the closest Catholic Church tabernacle to be disposed of by Jesus and never again return to harm me. Dear Holy Spirit, please fill up any void in me to overflowing with your great love. All this, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ by the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Immaculate Heart of Mary, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, please pray for me and with me. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.